The Myth of Sisyphus. This podcast and work deal, deals with the myth of Sisyphus, which is a philosophical essay by Albert Camus. The main concern of the work is the absurd. To start giving the general notion and the summary of the work, we should first perceive the concept of absurdity, which is a common theme in many existential works. The absurd comes from the comparison between human need and the unreasonable silence of the world. We want things to make sense, but this is not what the world has prepared for us. Because of this comparison, boredom and lack of meaning in life arise. As Camus states, there is a fundamental conflict between what we want from the universe, like meaning, order, sense, reasons, and what we find in the universe. Formless chaos. Camus describes the absurd condition. Life is meaningless and nonsensical, but humans strive constantly for meaning and sense in it, and that is the main problem. Science can only describe existence. It cannot explain why there is existence or what its meaning or purpose is. We will never find in life itself the expected meaning. Camus represents how absurdity strikes the characters, but his main concern in the works is the way out of the absurdity. For example, in the work called The Stranger, we observe the change of Uh, Marceau's approach to life, whereas in Sartre's works we observe the obtaining of absurdity and not the way out. The description of absurdity is not very distinct in Camus and Sartre's works. The characters become sarcastic, ignorant and uncaring. They are totally uncaring in both of the author's works. The subject of this um, podcast is to represent the ways out of the absurd and more precisely the relationship between the absurd and suicide, the exact degree to which suicide is a solution to the absurd. In Myth of Sisyphus, Camus undertakes the task of answering what he considers to be the only question of philosophy that matters. The question is, Does the realization of the meaninglessness and the absurdity of life necessarily require suicide? This is how Camus states that the meaning of the life is the most important question. I have never seen anyone die for the ontological argument. Galileo, who held a scientific truth of great importance, abjured it with its with the greatest ease as soon as it endangered his life. In a certain sense, he did right. That truth was not worth the stake. Whether the earth or the sun revolves around the other is a matter of profound indifference. To tell the truth, it is a futile question. On the other hand, I see many people die because they judge that life is not worth living. I see others paradoxically getting killed for the ideas or illusions that give them a reason for living. What is called a reason for living is also an excellent reason for dying. I therefore conclude that the meaning of life is the most urgent of questions. Uh, The Myth of Sisyphus is a philosophical essay, so we see that the words are mainly used in their denotational explicit meanings. Nevertheless, we can observe the epithet profound indifference, which is chosen deliberately to give a stylistically heavy impact and to show a higher degree of indifference. Suicide has never been dealt with, uh, dealt with except as a social phenomenon. On the contrary, we are concerned here at the outset with the relationship between individual thought and suicide. 
An act like this is prepared within the silence of the heart, as is a great work of art. <coughs> Here Camus used metaphor, the silence of the heart. He wanted to show with this the inner state of a person intending to commit a suicide. Killing yourself amounts to confessing. It is confessing that life is too much for you or that you do not understand it. Let's not go too far in such analogies. However, but rather return to everyday words. It is merely confessing that is not worth the trouble. Living naturally is never easy. You continue making the gestures commanded by existence for many reasons, the first of which is habit. Dying voluntarily implies that you have recognized, even instinctively, the ridiculous character of that habit, the absence of any profound reason for living, the insane character of the daily agitation, and the uselessness of suffering. Camus here reveals the main purpose of the suicide. That is the confession that life is not worth living. In the last sentence, we can see such epithets as ridiculous character of the habit, insane character of the daily agitation, which are used to emphasize the mood and the attitude of the person who is going to commit a suicide. With the help of such negative mood, we can feel that the person can see no meaning in the existence anymore, and his mere aim is to end the suffering he feels. At any street corner, the feeling of absurdity can strike any man in the face, as it is in its distressing nudity, in its light without effulgence, it is elusive. But that very difficulty deserves reflection. It is probably true that a man, a man remains forever unknown to us and that there is in him something irreducible that ex escapes us. But practically I know men and recognize them by their behavior, by the totality of their deeds, by the consequences caused in life by their presence. Likewise, all those irrational feelings which offer no purchase to an uh, analysis, I can define them practically, appreciate them practically, by gathering together the sum of the consequences in the domain of the intelligence, by seizing the noting of um, all their aspects, by outlining their universe. The first sentence is proved by Camus in many of his works. For example, in the work The Stranger, Marceau lives normal life full of expectations and goals unless he wonders, does it really matter if I die at the age of 13 or 30? Absurdity strikes him only when, only because of this uh, one thought and his whole life changes. The following parenthesis in its distressing nudity, in its light without effulgence, which also includes epithets, is used to give an aesthetic impact, which in fact is more typical of belletra style. In the passage, we observe Polis and Deton. By their behavior, by the totality of their deeds, by the consequences caused in life, by their presence, which makes the readers follow the stream of his ideas. All great deeds and all great thoughts have a ridiculous beginning. Great works are often born on a street corner or, or in restaurant revolving door. So it is with absurdity. The absurd world, more than others, derives its nobility from that abject birth. In certain situations, replying nothing when asked what one is thinking about may be pretense in a man. Those who are loved are well aware of this, but if that reply is sincere, if it symbolizes the old state of soul in which the void becomes eloquent, 
in which the chain of daily gestures is broken, in which the heart really seeks the link that will connect it again, then it is as it were the first sign of absurdity. In the following passage, absurdity is compared with great pieces of art. Here we can see an example of oxymoron. Absurd world derives its nobility from that abject birth. Obviously, nobility doesn't coincide with hopelessness. Misery in meaning. We see Paul's indebted at the end of the passage. It gives an artistic shade to the text, emphasizing each idea, showing the importance of each one. Here it is also uh, an example of uh, personification. Likewise, and during every day of an illustrious life, time carries us, but a moment always comes when we have to carry it. We live on the future, tomorrow, later on. When you have made your way, you will understand when you are old enough. Such uh, irrelevances are wonderful, for after all, it's a matter of dying. Yet a day comes when a man notices or says that he is thirty. Thus he asserts his youth. But simultaneously he situates himself in relation to time. He takes his place in it. He admits that he stands at a certain point on a curve that he acknowledges having to travel to its end. He belongs to time, and by the horror that seizes him, he recognizes the worst enemy. Tomorrow, he was longing for tomorrow, whereas everything in him ought to reject it. That revolt of the flesh is the absurd. We can see an example of irony here. Such irrelevances are wonderful. Camus intends to express the opposite meaning to show that these excuses are not appropriate, as the time goes on and very soon it will be too late to leave things for tomorrow. Another stylistic device used in the passage is epithet, an illustrious life, and metaphor, the horror seizes him. The mood of the passage is negative, as there is always some delay of the action until it gets too late. We can meet the condition of being afraid of actions in many other writers' works, like James Joyce, who shows how people get stuck in life, being afraid of changes, and avoiding taking steps that can let them out of comfort zone. Hmm. They would rather find excuses for the undone deeds than accept the reality. The fact that they are just too comfortable, too comfortable to change. This is exactly what Camus means in this passage. People like to procrastinate. So long as the mind keeps silent in the motionless world of its hopes, everything is reflected and arranged in the unity of its nostalgia. But with its first, first move, the world cracks and tumbles and infinite number of shimmering fragments is offered to the understanding. We must despair of ever reconstructing the familiar calm surface which would give us peace of heart. After so many centuries of inquiries, so many abdications among thinkers, we are well aware that this is true for all our knowledge. With the exception of professional rationalists, today people despair of true knowledge. If the only significant history of human thought were to be written, it would have to be the history of its success, successive regrets and its impotences. Um, in this passage, in this part, we can observe some examples of metaphors such as mind keeps silent, which is similarly an example of personification, and this world cracks and tumbles here as well. There are also epithets like motionless world, shimmering fragments. The devices are used to make the idea more profound and to make a more influential impact on the reader. So Camus analyzes the concept of suicide, which is committed in order to free oneself from the absurdity. 
Later we will see that he is against the solution and that life, in fact, is worth living despite its absurdity. Another way out of the absurdity he calls leap of faith, which is belief in God in order to give meaning to life. Many philosophers like Soren Kierkegaard, Lev Sestov, Fyodor Dostoevsky choose this way out, which is also not acceptable for Camus. Shostov discovers the fundamental absurdity for all existence. He does not say, this is the absurd, but rather, this is God, we must rely on him, even if he does not correspond to any of our rational categories. So that confusion may not be possible, the Russian philosopher even hints that this God is perhaps full of hatred and hateful, incomprehensible and contradictory, but the more hideous is his face, the more he asserts his power. His greatness is his incoherence. His proof is his inhumanity. One must spring into him and by this leap free oneself from rational illusions. In this part, Camus describes Shostov's approach to absurdity. Shostov thinks that belief in God is the only true solution when human judgment sees no solution, then we should turn toward God, even if he is unkind, unfair and hateful. For Camus, Shostov's approach to absurdity is itself an absurd, and he believes that this is not a way out, but just an escape. They try to derive hope from its contrary, death. I am taking the liberty at this point of calling the existential attitude philosophical suicide. But this does not imply a judgment. It is a convenient way of indicating the movement by which a thought negates itself, it negates itself and tends to transcend itself in its very negation. For the existentials, negation is their God. To be precise, that God is maintained only through the negation of human reason, but like suicides, gods change with men. There are many ways of leaping, the essential being to leap. Camus calls the faith to God a reason by despair, a philosophical suicide. He does not want to sound judgmental, but he sees God far from the human reason. This way out he regards as an act of betrayal to philosopher's mind, a desperate attempt to apply, obtain hope that death does not make life meaningless, but it is the beginning of some new life. Fyodor Dostoevsky puts his choice forward in such works as The Brothers Karamazov and Crime and Punishment. If God does not exist, everything is permitted. By Fyodor Dostoevsky is a popular phrase exploited by uh, theists, uh, theologians and conservatives when questioned about the connection between faith in God and morality. In this view, without the belief in a supernatural figure, a supernatural figure who maintains law and order in the universe, a man cannot regulate himself as a socially and morally acceptable individual. On the ground of rejecting both suicide and leap of faith, Camus gives his own way out of absurdity. Thus I draw from the absurd three consequences, which are my revolt, my freedom, and my passion. My revolt, my freedom, and my passion. By the mere activity of consciousness, I transform into a rule of life what was an invitation to death, and I refuse suicide. Come, you choose the third his own way out, which is recognition. He refuses suicide. He is free to think whatever he wants and to behave as he wants. He accepts absurdity and overcomes it considering that it's still worth living, even if life is meaningless. Camus quoted, 
You will never be happy if you continue to search for what happiness consists of. You will never live if you are looking for the meaning of life. There isn't any general meaning of life and it is pointless to waste your life looking for the meaning because it does not exist. As Camus said, the meaning of life is the meaning you give to your life. So the idea that life is meaningless does not presuppose that you cannot create your own meaning and make your own life meaningful. In the last chapter, Camus represents the myth of Sisyphus to some of the idea that suicide is not a rational solution for absurdity. Sisyphus is probably more famous for his punishment in the underworld than what he did in his life. According to the Greek myth, Sisyphus is forced to roll a rock up to a hill. However, every time he reaches the top, the rock rolls down the bottom. There are various versions of myth giving explanations for the reasons for such a heavy punishment that befell Sisyphus. According to one story, punishment in the underworld was because of Aegina, the daughter of Asopus. When Asopo searched for her, Sisyphus agreed to report that she was abducted by Zeus, provided that Asopo would give him water and in the citadel, um, yeah, would give him water in the citadel of Corinth. The most common version of the myth is that Sisyphus kept in captivity the spirit of death. So during the absence of death, people stop dying. The gods are concerned about this situation and in a few years Ares, the god of war, liberates the god of death. Afterwards, the latter plucks the soul of a Sisyphus and takes him back to the realm of the shadows of the dead. But even then, Sisyphus managed to deceive the gods. He forbade his wife to perform funeral rites after his death. Following the request of Sisyphus, gods let him return briefly to the ground to punish his wife for violating sacred customs. However, Sisyphus refused to return to the world, to the underworld, and lived to an old age before returning to the underworld, the second time to endure his eternal punishment. Uh, for most of us, Sisyphus' fate is horrible and helpless. However, Camus argues that this fate is horrible only on condition that we think there is something better to strive for. Pushing the rock up the hill seems to be meaningless punishment. But Camus insists on imagining Sisyphus happy. As soon as he accepts his fate, he becomes an absurd hero. He takes an absurd situation and tries somehow to give meaning to it. Camus implies there is no sun without shadow, pointing out to the dual nature of opposite things. Camus uses many stylistic devices so as to make a more powerful impact on the reader. One of them is allusion. He clearly alludes to the Greek myth of Sisyphus. Camus also makes many analogies. He compares Sisyphus to the absurd hero as well as with the rock, a face that toils so close to stones is already stone itself. A face that toils so close to stones is already stone itself. At the, at the very end of his long effort measured by skyless space and time without death, the purpose is achieved. Here we can find epithets like long effort, skyless space. Camus uses these expressions having the mere purpose to make the reader understand that Sisyphus' labor will never have its end. It is at this moment that Sisyphus interests Camus. He focuses on his state of mind, how he accepts his never-ceasing labor, how he becomes conscious and aware of the absurdity of his fate. In the passage, we can also observe various examples of juxtaposition. Camus contrasts man and God, freedom and punishment, life and punishment. Another, uh, another interesting and very important contrast is drawn between sun, water and the underworld. This is for giving sufficient reasons and arguments why Sisyphus broke his promise to go back to the underworld. 
We can also observe symbolism in the work. The stone symbolizes the means to reach the goal. For many people, the most important thing is the goal itself, while what really matters is the means, the way through which we reach our goals. For many people it may be stressful and what really interests them is the final destination. But here Camus represents how Sisyphus enjoys even that stressful action of pulling the rock up, up to the hill over and over again. Uh, Camus' works are interrelated. Let's take the example. Uh, let's take the example of the stranger, the myth of Sisyphus. Uh, compare them with each other. Sisyphus makes the, his absurd life meaningful. He struggles. He is not desperate. He makes the boring process of eternal struggle into a creative game, pleasure. He is happy and he is not annoyed. In the stranger, we witness the main character's soul's indifference to surroundings. He has already obtained absurdity and now nothing really matters for him. Why would anything matter if everything will end with death? He asks himself this question over and over again. Why would anything matter if everything will end with death? Nevertheless, when he is taken to prison and the death is so near, he suddenly remembers even the most trivial things he used to ignore, that he now realizes that he actually used to enjoy. Life becomes so meaningful that he says, At that time I often thought that if I had, if I had had to live in the trunk of a dead tree, with nothing to do but look up at the sky flowing overhead, Little by little, I would have gotten used to it. I will repeat. So life has become so meaningful that he says, At that time, I often thought that if I had had to live in the trunk of a dead tree, with nothing to do but look up at the sky flowing overhead, little by little, I would have gotten used to it. In both of the works, the mood changes from negative to a positive one. If first there is no hope, nothing to be happy about, then in the end everything attains meaning, and in both of the cases it becomes the choice of the characters to give life meaning. In both cases Camus adopts the idea that humans are able to get used to anything, and what really matters is our approach to the outer world. You can choose to be happy. But is it just a choice to make, a simple thought that can determine the level of your happiness? Do we need preconditions for happiness? In his work, A Happy Death, written two years before The Stranger, Camus exemplifies uh, the main character, Patrice Masso, who is in search of happiness throughout the work. The pondering over happiness starts when he has a conversation with Zagreus, a disabled character who thinks the most important precondition for happiness is money. To his mind, happiness is a long process. It takes a lot of patience and time. Once you have money, you have a choice what to do with your time and you don't need to spend your life earning money so as to be able to do what you really want to do. Time is what life is made of. So if you have money, you can buy time and use it without any obligation. But is it really enough to be happy? After killing Zacharias with his own consent, Marcel takes all his fortune. Now he is rich, but that doesn't make him happy. He goes in search of finding the true happiness. After a long search, he says, you make the mistakes of thinking you have to choose, that you have to do what you want, that there are conditions for happiness. What matters, all that matter is, is the will to happiness, a kind of enormous, ever-present consciousness. The rest women, art, success is nothing but excuses. As we can see, Camus comes to his utter thought that you will never be happy if you continue to search for what happiness consists of. Sisyphus gives up 
melancholy and sorrow the moment he accepts his absurd life. While pushing his rock up the mountain, there is nothing for him to struggle. But when Sisyphus descends the mountain free from his burden, he is aware. He knows that he will struggle forever, and he knows that this struggle will get him nowhere. It's pointless. This awareness is precisely the same awareness that an absurd man has in this life. We live a life full of struggles, goals, achievements and failures, yet everything comes to end with death. Camus concludes his uh, essay by stating that happiness and absurd awareness are connected. The final sentence is, one must imagine Sisyphus happy. He is aware of the absurdity of life. He has no false hope and this awareness of pure existence makes him genuinely happy. By making Sisyphus a rebel instead of prisoner he was supposed to be, Camus shows how to value things and find beauty and joy when confronted with the cold indifference of the outer world. The book declares that the way out of absurdity is embracing it. We should embrace the absurdity and value the personal existence through recognition, revolt, freedom and passion, revolt, freedom and passion, revolt, freedom and passion. This is the end of my podcast.